we uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the famous <coughs> Euler's equation, the I alpha plus omega cross I omega, we were able to reduce that down into what are called Cartesian matrix form. We discovered that a material body, a rigid body, is going to, you, once you've introduced a Cartesian coordinate system <coughs> for that body, that body is going to have mass moments of inertia and products of inertia with respect to that set of axes. Uh, those uh, mass moments and products uh, form the body's mass moment of inertia matrix. And the Euler's or moment equation of dynamics takes those nice uh, matrix, nice, I guess, matrix form. Uh, uh, relative to that Cartesian system. So we're focusing on primarily on some special cases where that simplifies tremendously. I pointed out to you that if we have the case of simple axis rotation where the omega and alpha vectors only have that k component, then most of the terms that come out of those equations just simply disappear and you're left with uh, x, y, and z component only. And it's even better if it's steady rotation, in which case the angular speed is constant, you wouldn't have to worry about those terms. You would just have an x and a y component and a, and a zero a z component. Uh, I think before the end of the day, we'll also get a chance to look at uh, the implications of what we call the special case of principal coordinates. What are principal coordinates? You have found a set of principal coordinates if you're able to determine that the body's products of inertia, all three of them, are equal to zero. That's the primary defining characteristic of what's called coordinate system. And, and under those circumstances, the uh, matrix equations above reduce to something that's still, <coughs> still pretty simple. All right, to um, give that first set of equations a little bit of a workout, we introduced this problem. I think I put it up, at least put it up on the board for you uh, at the end of class on, uh, on Wednesday. I didn't think we'd get, we didn't complete it. <coughs> but in looking at this simple rota rotating assembly, the first thing that was obvious was that it's not constructed from straight slender rods, obviously. Um, uh, but it is obvious where the mass center is, uh, just from the symmetry of the thing. And you can see that the mass center, of course, is important in its own right, but also the mass center is also an anchor point. Uh, so I'm going to choose that as my inertial force reduction point. Equally obvious that the acceleration of this point is zero. Therefore, this particular structure has no or a zero valued inertial force. Where are we going to put it? We're going to put it at our reduction point, which I select to be G. And with it, I'm going to put the G-based inertial couple. But how are we going to get the G-based inertial couple? Well, since it's not slender rods, I'm going to have to go, at least I think I'm going to have to go with this Cartesian matrix approach, which means I need to introduce a Cartesian coordinate system with its origin at that reduction point. And I'm going to also make sure that the axes are oriented so that the z-axis is along the axis of rotation. And why do I do that? So that I can exploit what I find on page 7 of the general course outline, which says if you have that case, then this will be your expression for the uh, inertial couple at that point. Notice the i direction, x comes out, i hat comes out of the board. So in i, y, z, omega squared, the i, y, z would give you a couple of points in the plus x direction, and whereas this term would give you a couple contribution that would be in the minus j direction. <coughs> so if that's the j direction, this would be the minus j direction. So that second part would give you a couple that looks like, looks like this. However, ixz is clearly equal to 0. Did we, get to that? Did we get that far on Wednesday? And how do we know that, that this ixz, that product of inertia, is equal to 0? Because <coughs> again, the x coordinate is normal to the page. Would you agree that every particle Every single particle that makes up this structure has a zero-valued x-coordinate. And because of that, zeros, you're going to get zero. The uh, xz product of inertia is going to be zero. I think likewise, we're I think we're able to look at it <coughs> and conclude, oh, by the way, were we able to say that when it comes to computing iyz, did we get so far as to say that's going to contribute nothing, this is going to contribute nothing, all the straight pieces contribute nothing? The reason that the vertical straight pieces contribute nothing is because all of their y coordinates are 0. And the reason that the horizontal straight section contributes nothing is because all of those z coordinates are equal to 0. So the only parts you have to worry about would be the circular parts. And uh, it's pretty obvious that those are both going to be positive. Because if you look at the products of the y z coordinates up there, that's a positive times a positive. Whereas if you look at the product of the yz coordinates down here, you're going to have a negative times a negative. 
So I think you can see that the product of inertia is definitely going to be positive. Now, how did I go about, how did I, what did I do to get it? Well, I just simply acknowledged that the book doesn't have any formulas in it for products of inertia. Sad fact. In any case, well, there's just sometimes you have to bite the bullet and pull out the old calculus. <coughs> so I'm going to just find out the products of inertia by calculus. Notice I introduced, I, I drew a little, a little mass element along that <coughs> upper quarter circular section. I introduced the variable theta, which is going to vary from theta equals 0 to pi over 2. I've looked at a little segment of that that's of uh, d theta. A little, would you agree with me that the mass of that little piece would be a differential mass? Would be lambda, the mass per unit length, times the little length of that piece? I think you'll agree with that. So here's your expression for the mass of that little piece. What about the y and z coordinates of this little piece? Well, the y coordinate would be a radius times cosine of theta. And the z coordinate would be radius times sine of theta. Now, there they are. So what's the product of the mass of that piece times its y coordinate times its z coordinate? It's this. And you can use the double angle formula to put it in a slightly different form. And then to get the total product of inertia for that section, <coughs> a little piece, you just have to do an integration. Add up the contributions for all the pieces. <coughs> and I'll let you do the integrals. It's pretty simple integration. I don't think you even need integration tables for that. But in any case, at the end of the day, doing your integral, you can figure out you're going to get 1 half lambda radius cubed is going to be the product of inertia for that little piece. By the way, the other uh, <coughs> piece down there in quadrant 3 is going to contribute the exact same amount. Uh, because when you set that up, your mass is going to be the same. But notice your y and z coordinates are going to have the same expression, except both are negative. But in any case, when you take the product of m, y, z, it's exactly the same along the lower piece as the upper piece. So when you put together the total product of inertia for the entire structure, there's your zeros from the straight sections. We've already talked about that. And then these are the two contributions from the quarter circular sections, giving you a total product of inertia of lambda r cubed. And leaving you with an inertial force diagram, that is i, y, z, lambda r cubed, omega squared in the i direction. There's your inertial force diagram. Right next to it is your free body diagram. It's pretty trivial to see that puts force in this direction equals 0, force in this direction equals 0. Oh, this must be the negative of this. Force in this direction equals 0, force in this direction must equal 0. Oh, therefore, the bearing reaction in the vertical direction must pick up the weight. And then total moment, obviously, 4r times f is going to have to equal the value of your inertial couple. And there's your solution. So there's your rotating bearing reaction in that statically, in that dynamically unbalanced shaft. Okay. So sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and do integration. However, you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to require you to do any of that. On a quiz or on a test or on a final, there will be no integration unless you decide to do it for some reason of your own manufacture. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you're happy to know that. Um, the next problem I want to do, <coughs> I'm actually going to do most of it on the board. So let's put the screen up and kill this. I, I like to choose my examples uh, so that each example introduces us to a new thing. And there's going to be, watch for it, there's going to be three new things in this problem. And I'll just tell you, preview what the names of those three new things are. Uh, there's going to be thing number one is going to be, I'll just title it now, resultant inertial force. Uh, thing number two, which may not sound like a new thing, but it kind of is, because we're going to take it further than you're familiar with, is we'll call this parallel axis theorem. Parallel axis theorem. And thing number three is going to be called planes of mirror image symmetry. Which I like to just use the abbreviation for. The abbreviation I like to use is just capital MIS for mirror image symmetry. So those are the three new things to watch for in this particular problem. Now, what does this problem look like? 
Well, it's a simple rotation. It's a s simple, steady rotation of a shaft, which is made up of slender rod stock, uh, which has a half circular section and a straight section. Uh, it's going to be bearing supported from below with a thrust here with a through bearing. Uh, we'll call B for bottom and right here, like so. Uh, the dimensions here. Let's uh, use some color. We're going to have dimensions of, oh, first of all, the radius of this piece is going to be R. We're going to use lambda as the, we've been using it all along, so it's uniform rod stock. So we'll take lambda to be the known mass per unit of length. The whole assembly is rotating happily with a nice constant angular speed about the fixed vertical axis. Okay. And both of these dimensions are going to be R, just to keep things fairly simple, like so. And of course, you can anticipate what the problem is. The problem is going to be, find the damn bearing reactions. What are the reactions in the bearings? This is considerably more complicated than the last one for a couple of reasons. By the way, would you agree that all the rotating shafts we looked at so far, the mass center was located along the axis of rotation and therefore had no acceleration? So uh, in all the previous shaft examples, there was no inertial force. Now, the different pieces might have had inertial forces, but the entire structure didn't uh, because the mass. By the way, when, the mass when, the ma when a shaft has its mass center along the axis of rotation, as is, was the case with the previous examples, that shaft is said to be statically balanced. To say that a shaft is statically balanced is only saying that the mass center is along the axis of rotation. This is statically unbalanced because the mass center for this structure is clearly to the right of the axis of rotation. So that's the first thing that makes it more complicated. By the way, let's number our pieces. I like to do that. So piece number one and piece number two. I think you can quickly write down what the masses of these pieces are, capital M1 and capital M2. A uh, half circle, an entire circle has a circumference of 2 pi r. So half a circle would be pi times r. So we're going to have pi r total length times the mass per unit length would be the mass of piece number one. And obviously, that's the length of piece number two. So there's the mass of piece number two. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, uh, we know the technique for trying to solve for these forces. It's my double diagram approach, free body diagram, inertial force diagram. The free body diagram, uh, a kid in the third week of statics could draw that for you. So we're not going to spend much time on it. We have to think about the inertial force diagram. So to get the inertial force diagram, what's my recipe? My recipe is figure out what the inertial force is. And once you figure out what the inertial force is, decide where in the hell you're going to put it. What are our usual options? Put it at the mass center or an anchor point if you got it. Well, we got lots of anchor points. As a matter of fact, any point along the axis of rotation would serve as an anchor point for this. So I've got lots of choices. And by the way, do we know where the overall mass center is yet? No, we don't. And we're never going to need to know. That's one of the tricks in this problem. I'm going to choose an anchor point as my reduction point, and I'm going to choose point A. So I'm going to choose, we're going to put, we're going to choose as our reduction point, we're going to choose point A because I feel like it. And once we've chosen point A as our reduction point, then we need to put the A anchor point based inertial couple. In order to get that inertial couple, I realize that I'm not dealing, we're not in Kansas anymore. We don't have straight uh, rod sections anymore. So I'm probably going to introduce my Cartesian matrix approach, inertia matrix and so on. So if I want to use some of the stuff that's on page seven of the general course outline, I had damn well better introduce a Cartesian coordinate system that has origin at the reduction point done. And I better orient that coordinate system so that the axis of rotation is the z-axis. So I'm going to choose, as we did in the last problem, let's choose the x-axis coming straight out of the board, like so. I'll choose, I want to choose a right-handed system too. Be careful. x, y, and then z would be going straight up like this. So there's my, my z-axis. So I've introduced the Cartesian system, which has its origin at the reduction point has the z-axis oriented along the axis of rotation. Page 7 of the general course outline, I realize I'm in that special case where I can just copy this equation 
right off of the page. Page seven of the general course outline. And uh, now there are some similarities between this problem and the previous one. The first similarity is what happened to this term in the first example? Is it still zero here? For exactly the same reason. Because if you look at the x, x axis is out of the board, every single particle that makes up this body has a zero valued x coordinate. So all we have to say is that all x keys are zero. That's why that's zero. Uh, let's see. Then we have to worry about the product of inertia I, Y, Z. Would you agree that I, Y, Z could, could perhaps have contributions from piece number one? And then again, it could have a contribution from piece number two, yes? But how much does piece number two contribute to the Y, Z product of inertia? Nothing. And why? Why? Because none, if you look at the all, every single particle that makes up body number two, Every particle has a zero-valued y-coordinate. So just like up there, you can say that this contribution would be zero because all of the y-coordinates are zero. So all you're left with is this. The iyz that you need in this expression is just going to be the product of inertia of this part, piece number one. So what we need is the product of inertia of this half circle with respect to the yz plane. Oh, and by the way, uh, can, you, uh, can you tell me something about the sign of this? What do you think about the sign of this? You think, do, you think you, do you think you can tell whether it's positive or negative? The product of inertia can be negative, can be positive as well. It's, can you see it's going to be positive? Because if you look at every single particle, all of these particles are in quadrant one. Well, first of all, these particles down here, uh, don't, we've already noticed they don't contribute anything. But since all of these particles are in quadrant one, all of these particles have positive y, positive z coordinates. So when you put together the product, that's good. I think you can tell that that's certainly going to be a positive number. Now, what did we do in the last problem to get that positive number? We set up an integration scheme. And I told you I wasn't going to give you any examples where you had to do integration. And I don't want to do any more integration either. I'm tired of it already. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get around integration. I'll show you how we're going to do it. But I can tell that iyz is going to be a positive number. So I'm already starting to get an idea of what this inertial force diagram looks like. There's the point A. There's the point B. Uh, I know that the, well, before I can actually start drawing this, had we better back up and try to figure out what this looks like? But I've already mentioned to you, do we know where the mass center of this structure is? No, so how am I going to get how am I going to get the inertial force to put on my inertial force diagram if I don't know where the mass center is? If I don't know where the mass center is, I can't figure this out, can I? Well, that's kind of true. Except, uh, you see, I told you to watch out for some things that are going to happen here. Uh, the first thing, the first extra bit here, comes from this. What do I mean by resultant inertial force? I happen to know that the total inertial force for a composite body is equal to the sum of the inertial forces contributed by each of the individual pieces. Which in this case, since we have two pieces, I know that the inertial force for the entire structure will be the vector sum of the inertial force for part number one plus the inertial force for part number two. Now you might say, um, <coughs> how does he know that? <coughs> Well, I'll tell you how I know that. <coughs> and it's something that you, we've already talked about. I just pulled up page five of the general course outline. Page five. Back, those are the equations that apply to any system of particles. And I went right to the top of the page where it says mass center relations. Look at this line right here. What does this line say? The total mass of a system or a comp the total mass of a composite body times the acceleration of its mass. Oh, why, what is mag? Isn't this, this would be the, what's, this is the inertial force for the entire body. Is e for a composite body is equal to the sum of all of the individual mags. Another way to write that is this. 
that the resultant inertial force for a body is always the vector sum of the inertial forces for the individual pieces, the sum of all the MAGs. So we can say that the, the inertial force for our composite body, the total mass of the acceleration of the mass center, I can get it without ever finding this vector because I know that it's going to be equal to m1ag1 plus m2ag2 from the mass center relations. And, and ag2, the acceleration of the mass center of piece number two, is clearly equal to zero. The mass centers are located here, making this equal to zero. Oh, where's the mass center for this? Anybody remember that? Do you know where your centroid tables are in the back of your book? Uh, I looked it up. I just went in, into my center. Here's the, here's the mass center of piece number one. And I went to the centroid tables, and I was able to determine that, let's put it like this. I'll draw this little dotted line up here. And, put these dimension lines like so. Uh, the shift distance over, if you look it up in a table, is 2r over pi. It's in the back of your book. Just look at a centroid table. And if you had a problem like this on an exam, I would make sure you had a copy of the centroid table because I don't want people having to memorize things like that. In any event, uh, let's put this together. Knowing this re resultant inertial force fact, <laughs> I can say that the inertial force for the entire structure is going to be 0 plus m1 uh, pi r lambda times the acceleration of its mass center. What kind of motion does this point have? Simple circular motion, radius of the path. 2r over pi is the radius of the path moving around with an angular speed of so radius times omega squared, and the direction will be straight in towards the center of the path. So when you do your arithmetic, you're going to get a cancellation there. You're going to get a 2 lambda r squared omega squared equal to 2 lambda r squared omega squared. And as a vector, it points to the left. So I'm able to figure out that the inertial force for my entire structure, 2 lambda r squared omega squared to the left. And where did we choose as our reduction point? I chose the reduction point as point A. So that's where it's going to go on the inertial force diagram. 2 lambda r squared omega squared. Now we have to figure out, the next step is to figure out the inertial couple that goes with it. But we've already boiled that down. We've thought about that a little bit. And we've got that the inertial couple comes all the way down to this, where iyz only has a contribution from the part that I have highlighted. And we already know that that's positive, but we don't have a value for it yet. I suppose we could set up some kind of integration, but I said I wanted to avoid that, right? So how am I going to avoid integration to get that product of inertia? Well, there's something called the parallel axis theorem, which you already know something about. Uh, that's a familiar phrase to you. You all know, or you should know, that if you have two parallel axes, one that goes through a body at the mass center and one that goes through a point offset from the mass center, you know that if you, well, is it, would it be important to know the distance between those two parallel axes? And if you knew the distance between those parallel axes, would it not be true that the mass moment of inertia of the body with respect to the offset axis would be equal to the mass moment of inertia with respect to the parallel axis through the mass center? Plus what? Plus the mass times the distance between those two axes squared. Well, that's the parallel axis theorem. And by the way, uh, uh, you're familiar with that. But you know, there's also a parallel axis theorem for there's also a parallel axis theorem for products of inertia. Uh, let me show you that. Let's look at the little picture to the right. I've got some rigid body. And here we have a Cartesian coordinate system, little x, y, z coordinate system with its origin over here at some point O. I'm starting to look like Miriam and Craig. Now I have a second coordinate system. I've added a second coordinate system to the picture, 
which has its capital XYZ axes parallel to the little XYZ axes, but the origin is selected to be at the body's mass center. Now, according to that, you would know that, would you agree with me that the I little x would be equal to I big x plus the mass times the distance squared, and an I little y mass moment of inertia would equal I big y plus the mass times the distance between those two axes squared, and z to z, you know, you're aware of that parallel axis theorem, but were you aware of this one? This or this? No, you weren't. You haven't seen that before, unless you... Unless, you've, unless this isn't your first try at 316, it turns out that the product of inertia with respect to the little xy axis is equal to the product of inertia with respect to the capital xy axis plus the mass times the y coordinate of the mass center times the x coordinate times the y coordinate. By the way, that mass center would have x, y, and z coordinates relative to the. Uh, Pretty easy to prove those things. By the way, if you go to page six of the general course outline, remember that's the equation that has all the boxes. The top box was the definition of the mass moment of inertia function. The second box was something referred to as the parallel axis theorem, although it didn't exactly look like this. And the proof of that stuff in the second box, I didn't go over it in class, but it's in your notes if anybody has found it. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But the proof of the equations in the box is based on the, the proof of these equations in this box is based on the equation in box two from page six of the general course outline, and the proof goes down in a few lines. Uh, I'm not interested in dragging you through the details of that because most of you aren't interested either, but it's obvious that there are parallel axis theorem results pertaining to products of inertia just like there are with respect to mass moments of inertia. By the way, is it clear that y squared plus z squared would be the distance between the little x and capital X axes? It would be the square of the distance by the Pythagorean theorem. So that's the square of the distance between the x axes, the y axis, and the z axis. But structurally, it's pretty hard to forget these equations once you've seen them once, isn't it? As a matter of fact, if you, you couldn't ask for more easily memorizable expressions for the parallel axis theorem as applied to products of inertia. Okay, so now that you're aware of that, uh, let's get back to the problem. Because of that result, watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take my orange marker and I'm gonna add, I've already got a little XYZ coordinate system. Let's put in a parallel set of axes with capital X coming out of the board, parallel to this one, capital Y axis going over here, and the capital Z axis going up there like that. That's a parallel set of axes. What are we looking for? What are we looking for? What's the last thing we need in this analysis? We need to find. We need to find the product of inertia of this piece with respect to the YZ plane. Parallel axis theorem says that the the, the, the product of inertia of that piece with respect to the YZ plane is going to be equal to the product of inertia of that same piece with respect to the capital YZ plane plus the mass of the freaking piece times the Y coordinate of that gravity center times the Z coordinate of that gravity center. And we're only talking about piece number one here. That's the only piece we're looking at. Yes? Fair statement of the parallel axis theorem. What does that second term look like? What does that second term look like? Well, what's the mass of piece number one? Was uh, We've already got that. That's going to be pi times r times lambda. What's the, y co what's the little y coordinate of this point? What's the little y coordinate of this point? It's going to be 2r over pi. And what's the z coordinate? the little z coordinate of this point is going to be a radius plus another radius is going to be 2r. So what we come down to is that the product of inertia for our structure, the contribution made only by piece number one, is going to be equal to the product of inertia with respect to the capital YZ plane plus the shift term which, if you look at that, the pi's cancel. I'm going to count one, two, three r's. Two times two is four. I'm getting four 
I think I'm getting four lambda r cubed. Am I doing my arithmetic right? I think I'm doing my arithmetic right. Now here's the next thing I know. Hmm, the next thing I know is that, oh, oh well you say, well, he told us he was trying to avoid integration. But really, haven't I just kicked the can down the road? Am I still facing a problem of integration? Uh, how am I going to get this? So I've changed it from trying to find the product of inertia of the half circle with respect to this plane. I've just changed it to now having to find the product of inertia with respect to this plane. Well, see, I, ha I know something else that you don't know yet, but you'll know it in a minute. I know something about mirror image symmetry. And mirror image symmetry tells me that that will be 0. And I'll show you how I know that in just a moment. But that being the case, I guarantee it, then we've got the last thing that we need. We have the IYZ. It's 4 lambda r cubed. And therefore, the inertial couple to go with that inertial force is going to be IYZ, 4 lambda r cubed, times omega squared in the positive i direction. The inertial force diagram is now complete. Positive i direction. 4 lambda r cubed times omega squared. There's your complete inertial force diagram. Now you might want to say, if you want to go ahead and solve, we'll get back to that question of symmetry in just a moment. What, what would the free body diagram look like? The free body diagram, remember you've got bearings here and here. You've got your bottom bearing with a B sub Y. It's a thrust bearing, so you could have some vertical force there as well. You've got the through bearing with an A sub Y. Uh, you've got, you don't need to find the mass center because can't we just put the gravitational forces in separately? We don't, we don't need to put them in as one force. There's no need for that. So the gravitational force coming from part number one would be the mass times g, pi r lambda times g. And the gravitational force for the second piece would be his mass times g. And there's your free body diagram. And we know that those two systems are statically equivalent. And even someone in a statics class could set up equations of balance. Same force, same force, same moments. Choose your moment point, And you could solve for all of the bearing reactions. And I'll show you the solution in just a moment. But the big, qu big question is, how is I able to just look at the picture and tell that the product of inertia of this piece with respect to the yz plane is equal to 0. How was I able to do that? Well, it has to do with mirror image symmetry. And I trust that you have a concept of what I mean by mirror image symmetry. And to sort of highlight that, let me uh, try to draw something. I'll attempt to draw something that looks like a heart lying on its side. And then I'm going to imagine a plane, some body. And I'm going to imagine a plane that passes through it. So imagine this body, a plane passing through. It could be a plane. This could be one of the uh, Cartesian coordinate planes, x, y, if I had a Cartesian system. Um, let's think about what does it mean to say that a plane divides a body into mirror image symmetric halves? What, I think we have an idea of that. Plane of mirror image symmetry. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, again, I think you have a intuitive concept of that. Look at this body, which consists of this lectern. If you were to imagine a plane going right down through this vertical plane, going right down through the center, would you say that more or less, you know, more of the dents and the gouges, would you say that more or less this lectern is mirror image symmetric with respect to that plane? Yes, because what you see on the one side of the plane is essentially an exact mirror image of what's on the other side. Now, if you were to pass a plane through like this, no, that's not a plane of mirror image symmetry. Or if you were to pass a plane halfway through a horizontal plane like this, no, that's not a plane. Of, so you have a sense of that. Uh, if a body is mirror, what does it mean to say that a, 
that a plane divides a body into mirror image symmetric halves, or that a plane is a plane of mirror image symmetry. Think about what that really means. What that really means is that for every little mass particle that's a certain distance h above the plane, there is an equal mass particle, an equal distance below the plane. That what you see on one side of the plane is an exact mirror image of what's on the other. Now, uh, what does that, why is it so important to be able to recognize planes of mirror image symmetry? Well, let me get a little handout here for you. Let's put that down. There's a very, well, there's a handout that actually is a quite a few pages, it's seven or eight pages. It's called Inertia Facts, uh, Important Inertia Function Facts. We're only going to deal with a few of them because we don't have a, a lot of time left in this course, but uh, there's a f at least two or three of the facts that you find in this handout are important, and the fact number one is big. What does it say? All products of inertia involving the normal coordinate to a Cartesian plane of mirror image symmetry are identically zero. So that's what we've got. All you see in the picture, by the way, here is a Cartesian system, X, Y, Z. And I'm going to assume, we're not showing you a body. The picture of the body actually isn't there. But imagine that there's a material body here, and you've introduced this Cartesian system. And imagine, just like you did a second ago, when you recognized that this plane going through here was a plane of mirror image symmetry, imagine that you've looked at the picture and you say, hey, the XY plane divides my body into mirror image symmetric halves. So imagine that you look at it, you say, hey, the XY plane divides the body into mirror image symmetric halves. The statement is that if the XY plane is a plane of mirror image symmetry, then any product of inertia involving the other coordinate, involving the, zero co the Z coordinate, the other coordinate, is going to be equal to zero. Now, why is that true? It's trivial. Remember, for a mirror image symmetric body, every mass particle above the plane by a distance c is going to have an evil twin equal mass partner below the plane by a distance c. And because of that, look at what happens. Look at a particle above the plane that has a mass m and x, y, z coordinates a, b, and c. That particle has an evil twin we'll call p2, which is the same exact mass, the same exact x and y coordinates, but the opposite z coordinate. There's his equal mass evil twin below the plane. Now what happens when you start to compute, let's say, what happens when you start to compute, say, Ixz, the product of inertia with respect to the xz plane, z being the other coordinate, right? Well, let's see. First put in the contribution from P1, then immediately put in the contribution from his partner below the plane. And how does that go down? They each have the same mass. Each particle has the same x coordinate, but the particles have exactly opposite z coordinates. So if you go through the process, similar terms, other mirror image pairs, you can see that every, the contribution made by every particle above the plane of mirror image symmetry is exactly canceled out by his partner uh, below the plane. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. It goes down like this. If you identify, let's put it this way. If you can look at a picture and say that xy is a plane of mirror image symmetry, if you can identify that, say, the xy plane is a plane of mirror image symmetry, you can say then that any product of inertia involving the other coordinate, the other coordinate must be equal to zero. Because it works the same for ixz as it does for iyz. Very important fact. All products of inertia involving the normal coordinate to a plane of mirror image symmetry are identically zero. And again, the proof is as you've seen it there. It's pretty, pretty trivial. How did I apply that in this particular problem? The orange coordinate system. <laughs> what did we need? We needed, well, it kind of got erased over here, didn't it? But we needed to know we had that I, Y, Z was equal to capital I, Y, Z plus the mass times yada, yada, yada. And I was able to say that this was zero. What allowed me to say that that was zero? Well, I look at the orange coordinate system and I say, does this plane divide 
the half circle into mirror image symmetric halves above and below? Obviously. And what's the normal coordinate to that plane? Z. So that any product of inertia involving Z has to be equal to zero. And I finish the problem off without having to do any integration whatsoever. Mirror, recognizing coordinate planes of mirror image symmetry is crucially, crucially important. Okay? Now I want to go, I want to just extend this problem a little bit uh, to uh, sort of <coughs> rethink it in a way. When we did this problem, <coughs> the first crucial choice that I made was to choose the point A as the reduction point. But didn't I have, didn't I have other alt options? I, could, I didn't have to choose A as the reduction point. I could have chosen other points. As a matter of didn't I say that every stinking point along the axis of rotation would be a, 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 an anchor point? So I could have equally chosen any other point. What if I had chosen point O as the reduction point? If I had chosen point O as the reduction point, then I would have constructed my inertial force diagram by putting the inertial force at that. So what would my inertial force diagram look like if I had chosen O as the reduction point? Well, I would have taken my inertial force and placed it there. And with it, I would have to put the, I would have to put the O-based inertial couple. Ah, oh, but if I put in a, Let's you know, follow the same steps we were just following. If I put in an x, y, and z coordinate system with its origin at point O, then I could have used the formula from page 7, yes? I, y, z, omega squared to the i, same one. I could have used this very same equation. And could I have, just as I did there, could I have said that i, x, z is equal to 0? Uh, certainly. By the way, a different coordinate system, but still, all the x coordinates are equal to zero. <coughs> Likewise, I could have said that i, y, z is going to have two contributions, one from each part. And uh, again, this was part number one, and this was part number two, and wouldn't it be equally, just like in the last analysis, it would have been obvious that that contribution would be zero because all of the y coordinates are equal to zero. And what about this guy. What's the product of inertia with respect to the yz plane of this other piece, piece number one? That's zero, but what's the argument there? Why? What's the, I can't say that all of the y coordinates are zero or all the z coordinates are equal. It's a different argument. The reason I can cross that out is because the little xy plane is a plane of mirror image symmetry. Therefore, any product with a little z and it's got to be equal to zero. So xy is a, because xy, little xy, is a plane of mirror image symmetry because that plane divides the body into mirror image symmetric halves above and below. Any product of inertia involving z is going to be equal to zero. Well, that knocks this out, which knocks everything out, which tells me that the Inertial couple to go with this inertial force is equal to zero. So this is just as valid an inertial force diagram as this one is. You say, well, how can that be? Well, it's obviously true, isn't it? What if you were to move this force down to here? If you were to move this force down to here so that you saw this, wouldn't you in the process have introduced a couple? And what would be the moment of the couple? This times 2r. Can you see trivially that this system of one force and a couple is statically equivalent to that single force? So that when you solve your equations, you're going to get exactly uh, the same thing, two alternative ways of seeing the problem. But I, I love problems that allow me to bring in new stuff. And I said, watch for it. There's going to be three new things in this problem. Uh, res result in inertial force, parallel axis theorem, even for products of inertia, and also the importance of recognizing planes of mirror image symmetry. But let's, uh, let me just not put this problem away just yet, but let me show you another little handout. Highlighting this business of mirror image symmetry. As I've just showed you, 
if you can identify the xy plane as a plane of mirror image symmetry, <coughs> that's going to take down or take out any product of inertia involving the other coordinate, in this case, the z coordinate. It's an interesting fact that if you can uh, identify a certain coordinate plane as a plane of mirror image symmetry, isn't it interesting that it doesn't tell you a damn thing about the product of inertia with respect to that plane? Seems almost opposite of what it should be, but uh, it's almost like you would be happier if, oh, a plane of mirror image symmetry, then the product of inertia must be zero. No, it's the opposite of that. It's every other product must be zero, but I don't know anything about that. What if you are able to, what if you have a material body? And what if you're able to uh, introduce a Cartesian coordinate system for which two of the Cartesian planes divided into mirror image symmetric halves? Oh, by the way, is it clear that what we just said about XY being a plane of mirror image symmetry would apply just as well to the YZ plane being a plane of mirror image symmetry or the ZX plane? What happens if you're able to introduce a Cartesian system for which two of the planes divide the body into mirror image symmetric calves? Is it clear that that would take down all of the products of inertia? So if you can find a Cartesian system for which two of its planes divide the body into mirror image symmetric halves, you are guaranteed that all three of the products of inertia are equal to zero. Then what, kind of, what do we call such a coordinate system? A coordinate system relative to which all the products of inertia are zero is called a set of principal coordinates for the body. An example of that would be what if you had a solid right circular cone and what if you chose a Cartesian coordinate system with its origin right at the base? And you had the x-axis coming out like this, and the y-axis here, and the z-axis going right up through the tip of the cone. Um, first of all, is it clear that the xy plane would not be a plane of mirror image symmetry? But is it clear that the xz plane would divide the cone into mirror image symmetric halves? And also that the yz plane would divide it into mirror image symmetric halves. So recognizing that, can't we immediately say that the xyz coordinates are principal coordinates for this body, and therefore the body has no products of inertia relative to that? That's a really cool thing to observe. Now, I said I wasn't yet putting away this, this problem. Let me get page 7 of the general course outline up again. Our second special case was what happens to the equations of motion, particularly the moment equation, for the special case of principal coordinates. Well, uh, I'm at least claiming this is true. If you go back to the full expanded matrix forms, you find out that uh, the, the three components of the Euler moment equation reduce to this in the case of uh, a principal coordinates. So let's get back to that in just one little short second. But let's take a look. Let's take a look at this picture that we had right here. There's my x, y, z coordinates that were introduced in my second analysis of this problem. Uh, let's look at part number one. Look at piece number one. That's the circular piece. For piece number one, would you agree with this statement? First of all, well, we've already mentioned that the x, y plane is a plane of mirror image symmetry for piece number one, right? So x, y is a mirror image symmetric plane. But keep rolling here. How about the plane of the board? What about the y, z plane? Does the y, z coordinate plane divide that into mirror image symmetric halves on this side and this side? Yes, nothing is the mirror image of nothing. So not only is the xy plane, a plane of mirror image symmetry, the yz plane is as well. And what does that tell me? Those two facts taken together to tell me that part number one has no products of inertia, doesn't it? Look at piece number two. Um, again, the plane of the board divides piece number two into mirror image symmetric halves, nothing being the mirror image of nothing. So for piece number two, the yz plane is a 
mirror image symmetric plane. Any other planes? What about the XZ plane? Does that divide piece number two into mirror image symmetric halves left and right? Yes, nothing is the mirror image of nothing. So uh, the YZ and the XZ planes are both planes of mirror image symmetry, telling me that piece number two has no products of inertia either. So therefore, the whole structure doesn't have any products of inertia. So what kind of coordinate system is that green system right there? for this structure, principal coordinates. Because relative to that coordinate system, this structure has absolutely no zero products of inertia. Well, you know what? That really presents us with a little bit of an alternative. Because instead of using, instead of using, instead of using this special case of simple fixed z-axis rotation to do that second analysis, couldn't I, once you recognize that those coordinates are principal coordinates, we could have instead used, we could have used these equations down here instead, couldn't we? Now you might want to say to yourself, well, how are you going to use those because we haven't figured out all of the mass, wouldn't you have to know all the mass moments of inertia? It looks like you would, right? But, but check it out. You see, in this case, you, you don't have to know those. And why, why don't you have to know those? Well, look at the equations. We'll uncover them here. Uh, does that shaft have an angular acceleration? So all of the components of the alpha vector are all zero, yes? Uh, and what's the only, only non-zero component of the angular velocity vector? The only non-zero component is this one, so that this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero, and this is zero. So what would come out if you decided to use, once you've recognized that that coordinate system with its origin, I know it was a set of principal coordinates, wouldn't this equation also have come into play? And wouldn't that equation also have con confirmed what? That the three components of the inertial couple are zero, zero, and zero. So next week, we're really going to focus on the use of principal coordinates. As a matter of fact, I'm going to keep you just a couple minutes, uh, a couple more minutes, and then we'll get out of here. But I want to show you what the next problem is going to be right after your final quiz on, uh, on Monday. We'll dig right into this problem, which involves a, a disk which is badly welded onto the top of a shaft. It was intended to be perpendicular to it, but they screwed up the weld and it turns out that it's canted by a certain angle. Now the motion is our familiar old fixed axis steady fixed axis rotation. So quite clearly you could do this problem by using the fixed z-axis rotation special case. By the way, is it clear that this part is dynamically inert? So all you have to worry about is the inertial force diagram for the disk. Would you all, if you were asked to draw the inertial force diagram for the disk, would you all choose the center point O as the reduction point? Is it also clear that it has no inertial force because the, it looks like the mass center has no acceleration? So it would, all come down to, it would all come down to trying to figure out the O-based inertial couple. And if you wanted to go with a simple fixed axis rotation, you would introduce a Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, and z, that has the z axis up along the axis of rotation. And um, you would pick this equation right off of uh, page 7 of the general course outline, and you would start looking at this. And you would start to say, hmm, what do I know about these products? Well, why would this be 0? Here's your edge view of the disk. There's the edge view of the disk. There's the y-axis. There's the z-axis. Here's the x-axis. Does the yz plane divide the disk into mirror image symmetric halves? So therefore, any product with an x would have to be equal to 0. OK, so it would come down to figuring out iyz. Well, how are you going to do that? Um, I don't think the parallel axis theorem is going to help you. I, um, I don't think uh, mirror image symmetry is going to get you any further. 
I think you probably have to set up some kind of an integration. You'd have to do an integration over a circular area that's canted at an angle of beta. Yeesh. I don't like the sound of that, do you? So you know what? I would shit can that approach because it's led me down an alley where I don't want to go. I don't want to have to set up some kind of integration to determine, and there is no table for it. So you shift gears. And what have I done? I've changed my coordinate system. Notice I put in another coordinate system, an X prime, Y prime, and Z prime coordinate system. Now, why is that such important coordinate? Why is that new coordinate system so important? Because they are principal coordinates for the body. So what I'm going to do is shift gears, ditch the simple fixed axis rotation special case, and go introduce a set of principal coordinates, which is obvious, and then go the new route. Use that next set of equations to figure out what the inertial couple is. So we'll start right up here after the quiz, after the quiz on the Monday.